Hey folks, so we're back again today and we're looking further at increasing your website's conversion. We're going to take a look at seven techniques that you can use to increase the conversion rate of your website starting today. The first technique, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, is simply to have a go. If you've got a website that's making sales and you've not run a test against that site, the best thing that you could do is actually just give yourself half an hour to 45 minutes turn off Twitter and Skype and your phone and whatever else and ask yourself the question, okay, what are the key sales elements of this site? What could I do with them? What could I test to increase the conversion rates? And you know, typically if you come up with a bunch of headlines, you know, some of them will do better and some of them will do worse. And the ones that do better, you've then got forever. You just use those. And the same for bullets and for graphics and other bits and pieces. So, uh, you know, I've seen this on, on, particularly on sites that haven't had much testing done to them. Simply the, the act of testing anything will increase the conversion rates often, often quite surprisingly well. If you want to be a little bit more systematic about it, one key issue that I see a lot is the whole notion of logical flow. Logical flow is how easy, how logical is it for me to work my way through this website. Uh, and and the, the underlying premise being that confusion justifies abandonment. If people come to your website and feel confused, even if you've got a great sales pitch, if they that, that gnawing feeling in the back of their mind of I'm not really sure what this is or I'm a little confused about what the offer is, that will cause people to, to leave oftentimes more than anything else. And so you can't have a confused user. And uh, that can be both from a sales perspective and just from a logical flow. And I have an example with a good friend of mine who has a very successful software business, you know, selling well into the millions of dollars. Uh, but he has a website that has a major portion of it that's just really hard to use. And I'm convinced that he's leaving millions of dollars on the table by not sorting out that issue and we'll be helping him to do that. You want to be clear on a given page what your desired response is. Oftentimes pages start out with a clear desired response and then over time because of different pressures in your organization, more and more and more gets added to your website and then it becomes really cluttered and you don't know what the, when someone comes, you don't know what the main thing is. You wanna have a single primary response on every website, every page. What is the main thing you want people to do? You can then have multiple secondary responses and, a, and quite a number of tertiary responses. But you know, a primary response might be something like, you know, the homepage of Market Samurai, we want people to subscribe for the free trial. That's really what we want them to do. Now, a secondary response might be go and buy the product. It would be, you know, view um, support and training materials, etc. But we want the main thing we want them to do is, is use the trial because consumption of the product is what drives purchases more than anything else. The, the tertiary response would be something like join our affiliate program, which is a small link, you know, on the, on the homepage. Something that's really important specifically when looking at home pages is the notion of orientation before you seek to engage. Sometimes you've got a great sales message, but people don't actually know, they've come to a website, they don't actually know what you're about. And so that it goes back to this confusion issue that you, you want to be able to, the first few seconds when people visit your website, they orientate. Then you want to engage them, you want to draw them into your sales message. Then you show them value, you, you, you use your bullets, etc., to convince them of the value of your offering and then you try and get paid. But if you just go straight for engagement and people don't actually know where they are, they can't orientate themselves, they'll actually click the back button before you even get to engage them. And it's particularly true on home pages, um, more so sometimes than landing pages. Just a really obvious thing is that each step in your process should reinforce the, the value proposition. You know, if you're running a Google AdWords ad about headache cures and it's one of 10 things that your website does, that ad shouldn't go to the homepage. That ad should go to the page that talks about headache cures because you want a logical flow from the advertisement source through to the landing page, through to the purchasing process. It should reinforce the value proposition. Don't expect people to go and hunt and find things on your website. And I, I say that, but that is just a, this mistake gets made an awful lot. You want to use expected metaphors. People, you know, you want to use things that people are expecting. Don't ask people to think, you know. I've seen people trying to, um, you know, break the mold and in doing so they come up with metaphors and, and, and um, design patterns on a website that are just totally confusing. Uh, and so don't do that. You know, let people, you, it's okay to use a shopping cart if you've got a shopping, a site that demands a shopping cart. You know, don't try and break the mold. Reduce friction. 
Often ordering processes can be an eight-step process that's really difficult to get through because you just that's the way it was designed. And we've been guilty of this. If, if your ordering process is hard to use, fix that up. That will be losing you a lot of money. And uh, you know it's okay to ask people questions after they've purchased, you know, surveys and stuff. But you want to make your ordering process as easy as possible to use. Sometimes you just can't renovate a site. Sometimes you have to detonate. You have to get rid of it. So sometimes you need to make that hard decision. In many cases, you can put a new skin or a new visual front end to a website to resolve a bunch of those problems. But sometimes you've just got to get rid of the whole back end, and that's a can be a hard decision to make. Technique number three is make your core benefits clear. Know what the main triggers of buying behavior are, and if you can't state those, go and ask your customers what they are, and make them really clear on your website. I see a lot of times these are buried down deep and, and you're losing sales because of it. Ask yourself, is it obvious to my customers what my main core benefits are when they visit the pages they're first gonna to get to on my site? This is good use of headlines, good use of bullets, good use of graphics. You want to talk to the best salesperson in an organization if you're in a consulting arrangement. Um, often it's the owner of the company, if it's a large company, isn't actually the best salesperson. You want to talk to the highest performing salesperson, listen to the way that they sell, um, you know, get them to pitch you on the product. If you will do that, you will often elicit, they often will do it subconsciously, you'll find out what really it is that makes this website sell. Being specific. You know, grand claims that we are the best in the industry and we're wonderful, our customer service is good and everybody loves us, is easy to ignore. In fact, most people will. But if you can be specific with believable claims, uh, you know, around the ways that you've helped customers, uh, around the, the size of the number of customers that you've helped, things that you've done that are specific and punchy. Sometimes I see this being a little bit cheesy and, and people making income claims, specifically in internet marketing, that I think they, they cause me to... To, to disbelieve the claims, but if they used well, specificity and being specific is a really powerful increase or a driver of conversion. So be specific in your claims and certainly test this out because I think there's a lot of gains to be had there. Improving your sales copy. I just want to say that I don't think it's realistic to pay a sales copy writer to do all of your sales copy. You should be communicating lots to your customers and to your database and you just often can't afford and it doesn't make sense to get a copywriter to do all of that. You are much better to improve your own salesmanship and your own sales copywriter, copywriting skills, and then use copywriters. And I think the world actually, I think there is a shortage of good copywriters. I think the world needs more of them. But you want to bring them in to take your, you know, your seven out of ten copy copy that you've written, your 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 pretty good copy, to make that a ten out of ten, and and you know, get them to really refine the core elements of your sales process. But you know, the day-to-day -day emails that you're going to send with offers and bits and pieces, you need to have a basic level of copywriting skill. And a technique that Eugene, our, our CEO, um, taught me is that if you're going to write copy, get a swipe file, which is a set of example copy documents from you know, one of the greats, you know, Gary Halbert or, or Dan Kennedy or John Carlton, one of those you know, high caliber copywriters. And, and before you write copy, just spend 20 to 30 minutes just writing out the bullet points that they've used. Copy them out by hand with a pen and a pencil, and a pen and paper, not, not in a keyboard. And you'll find that you'll naturally get some of that thinking into your brain. And when you sit down to write your own copy, it'll be quite a few notches better than if you hadn't done that. And uh, again, that copy will help you to sell better. It's going to make you more money, so it's worth the time. You want to use deliberate persuasion techniques. If you're not aware of what these is, I'm going to touch on them now. But Robert Cialdini in um, in Influence and and, uh, and other books is one of the is a, is the author that you have to read in this space. He, he's he's simply he's simply brilliant. Uh, and so some of the techniques that uh, he picked up by going to cults and looking at the way people persuade people and going to sales organisations, which may be the same as cults in some some cases. Um, you know, the different, the different uh, things that he picked up are really quite brilliant. So it's things like reducing risk. You know, I've seen this numerous times that a good risk reduction, a guarantee or a refund policy done well will increase your sales far more than the cost of the returns that you have. And to be blunt, you should have it anyway. If, if what you do isn't good, people should be able to get their money back. 
adding in social proof, so the use of testimonials. And there's a skill to doing this well, you know. A good video testimonial by someone who's a bit quirky and can make great claims is a whole lot better than a text testimonial from Bob in Orlando who said this product was wonderful and I really enjoyed using it. You know, you want your testimonials to have punch, you know. The more you can introduce multimedia, the more you can have photographs, audio, those things and specific claims in your testimonials will help you. And increasingly we're seeing instead of testimonials, people using feeds from um, Facebook and Twitter and those sorts of things that are showing that you know, not just me as the product owner saying this is wonderful, it's actually the other people using it saying it's wonderful. Increasing likability, you know, often we feel like we're dealing with a, a faceless organization and if you can put a face to that, that can make a real difference in your conversion. It's, it's, it's putting some personality into your sales pitch. And that can either be yourself if you're dealing with a, a broad spread of buyer types, or if you're dealing with a specific audience, you know, Asian women between 35 and 50, you, you may want to have a representative or, or you may want to put a face that is an Asian woman in that bracket um, to speak to that market. You really want to, you, you, want to, you want to speak to your market in a voice that they are most going to gel with and most going to like. Using authority endorsement, that's, you know, it could be medical experts, it could be other people in places of authority, it could be expert leaders in your marketplace, it could be celebrities. Um, you know, getting that, that endorsement from, from people of authority that your marketplace looks up to uh, can make a big difference in your conversion. And prop, I think the last one on this list is scarcity, and this is great if used well. Um, you know, the ability to put out an offer and say this is a time limited offer, or this is a number of items limited offer can work really well. It needs to be to be believable. You can't say you've only got three copies of your ebook left. That's an unbelievable claim. But as long as it's believable and you're willing to back it up and stop people buying after the deadline runs out and have some disappointed customers, which is great because then the next time they'll buy from you and believe your offer. Um, that scarcity thing can work really well. Reciprocity is just the notion of giving something of really good value before you give before you ask for something back. And you know, in Market Samurai, there's a free module that's that's one of, if not the most popular module in the software, is forever free. And so um, that notion of giving before you get back is a is a really important um, principle and, and can work really well to increase your conversion. The final technique is simply the notion of segregating your channels, which says if I can present different sales messages and refine them differently for the channels of advertising or marketing that I'm using, then I will generally do a lot better. So that says, you know, if I'm uh, running advertising in, in magazines as well as AdWords and I can drive them to different sales messages and refine them differently because that will represent different customer groups, then I will increase my sales performance. Now, one step above this is when you segregate each of your, channel, each of your channels, you look at which converts the best and which makes you the most money, a, you can drop the stuff that's not working, but B, if you find a channel that's really profitable, the obvious thing to do is go and try and replicate that channel. Now, if you've found a magazine, if you haven't tried magazine advertising before and you find a magazine that's great, then why not look for other magazines and see how they perform for you? Or look for other ways to tap into that same group or that same demographic of customers. You may be able to discover a customer group through um, a magazine advertisement and then replicate them through Facebook um, because you can get the same sort of demographic profiling. So s segregation of your channels is a really important technique for increasing your conversion rates. So folks, I think that uh, that wraps up this video. Uh, in the next one, we're gonna look at uh, a little bit of the bad news, just giving you this, some balance, and then we're gonna go through the checklist, uh, and I'm gonna walk you through that specifically so that you, you get a really good idea of how to use that. And, uh, and folks, that'll, that'll, that'll round out our conversion, uh, conversion discussions.